Why do you believe what you believe? For you to believe something does not take an act of will. To believe any fact, you must simply either accept the authority of the person presenting the fact, or be convinced by the fact presented. Accepting the authority of the person presenting the fact is blind belief. You are trusting not only that the person would not deliberately mislead you, but also that they have not made a mistake or been misled themselves. If David Attenborough tells you that a species of spider has 48 knees, you might simply take his word for it. Or you might want to check it out for yourself. It all depends on how important that fact is to you. If you choose to accept David's word for it, then you might continue to believe this spider has 48 knees. You may harbour hangover beliefs, things which you accepted as a child when your capacity to challenge authority had not yet developed, or in fact anything which you were once told and were simply not inclined at the time to validate. If these hangover beliefs are inconsequential, then so what? But if they affect how you live your day-to-day -day life, then you would be extremely naive not to challenge them. Spiders with 48 knees is a fairly inconsequential fact. But what about the end of the world as you know it? If someone tells you that your world is going to change dramatically through divine providence or natural circumstance, then you would probably agree that it would be utterly irresponsible to take that person's word for it. The motto of the Royal Society is nullius in verba, take nobody's word for it. In the end, you are the only authority you should rely on when it comes to your beliefs. Our collective knowledge has been built up fact by verified fact over countless generations. Each basic building block of knowledge, each individual fact can be verified. We can, if we choose to, educate ourselves from first principles so that we can be confident in the facts presented to us. If you want to test those facts, it is up to you to do the research. Do not let other people educate you into their own false beliefs. To prove you cannot choose what to believe and that your beliefs might be changed by education, I have seven facts to tell you and I want you to believe some of them. I want you to believe the first, third and fifth fact that I tell you. I realise, of course, that this is a ridiculous thing to ask. None of us gets to choose what we believe. But won't you at least try? Let me give you the facts and please make a mental note of your gut reaction as to each one's veracity. There was once a grown man who could fit inside an ordinary wine bottle. Swallows do not migrate. Instead, they spend the cold winter months buried in the mud at the bottom of lakes. A man was once witnessed being chased into hell by the devil. In England there was a sand dune the size of 1,000 football pitches which swallowed up streets of houses. A man was kept alive by wild birds bringing him meat sandwiches to eat. There was a woman in England who gave birth to rabbits. And finally a baboon was once employed by South African railways as a signalman. So what do you think? Or rather, what do you believe? Some of these stories you will have immediately dismissed, and some you will have thought, mm, maybe so. Your initial gut reaction was based on everything that you have learned in your journey through life. You did not choose which stories to believe, you reacted to them. Of course, whether you believe something to be true or not has no bearing on whether it is, in fact, true. So let us consider these facts in more detail and see if your gut reaction served you well. There was once a grown man who could fit inside an ordinary wine bottle. Well, on Monday, January the 16th, 1749, the Haymarket Theatre London was packed to the rafters to see a man who claimed that he could transport himself into a bottle. The audience of all classes became restless when the performer did not appear, and slightly more than restless when it became apparent that someone had done a runner with the night's takings. A riot ensued, the inside of the theatre was trashed, and a bonfire was built in the street outside from its finery, fixtures and fittings. Now, had the crowd turned up expecting to witness an incredible shrinking act, or simply to be entertained? In 1749, more people were ready to entertain the incredible than perhaps they are today. 
and these were superstitious times. Two years after these events, Ruth Osborne, a woman in her seventies, would be murdered by a mob who accused her of witchcraft and made her undergo trial by ducking. So what about the swallows which do not migrate but spend the cold winter months buried in the mud at the bottom of lakes? As late as 1878, noted ornithologist and founder of the American Ornithologist Union, Elliot Coos, dedicated an entire chapter of his book, Birds of the Colorado Valley, to the migration habits of the swallow, in which he cited several historic accounts that swallows plunge into the mud, become torpid, and hibernate like frogs. He went as far as to state, I see no reason why a swallow should not stay a while in the mud in a state of suspended animation. And it is attested by the most positive, direct and explicit testimony of eyewitnesses whose veracity is unimpeached, whose competency is unchallenged, and who, being neither knaves nor dupes, have reiterated the evidence for a period of several centuries. And I have no means of refuting the evidence and consequently cannot refuse to recognize its validity. Now, Coos was not alone in entertaining the idea of submarine swallows. In the aforementioned chapter on the subject, he listed no less than 182 papers supporting the idea. And it was only in November 1944 that the United States Fish and Wildlife Service released a paper providing the solution to a centuries-old riddle of bird migration. The report states that, the mystery surrounding the location of the Chimney Swift's winter home was so great that even eminent naturalists of the past generation fell back on weird medieval theories, such as the one that the birds buried themselves in the mud of swamps and hibernated until spring. But this announcement that leg bands from Chimney Swift's ringed in the USA had been recovered in northern Peru finally put an end to a much documented myth which had been repeated by eminent scientists for over 2,000 years, beginning with Aristotle, if not before. Why, I wonder, were so many people prepared to believe that story? Why would people have repeated it and provided eyewitness testimony? Is it a story you would have believed had you lived a 100 years ago? If you had lived in 1687, would you have believed that the devil was seen chasing a man into hell? Well, apparently, a judge on the King's Bench in London did believe just that. The story goes that a Mrs. Booty sued a Captain Barnaby for slander to the tune of £1,000. Apparently, Captain Barnaby and others were shooting rabbits on the volcanic island of Stromboli, north of Sicily, and whilst there they saw a man being chased by another into the fire of the volcano. Barnaby shouted to the assembled men that he recognised the man being chased as one Mr. Booty, or Old Booty, his next-door neighbour. The men apparently made a note of the precise time in their pocket-books and wrote up the incident later in their respective journals. Fast forward and the ships arrive back in England at Gravesend, where Barnaby's wife meets them with the news that their neighbour, Mr. Booty, was dead, to which Barnaby replied that he had seen him being chased into hell at the precise time of his death. The story got back to Mrs. Booty, at which point she sued for slander, not wanting it suggested, of course, that her beloved husband was now anywhere else but in heaven. And so the case comes before Judge Sir Edward Herbert on the King's Bench, who hears witness testimony from all those present on Stromboli, who identify the clothes belonging to Old Booty as those worn by the man being chased into the volcano. The judge's verdict? Lord, have mercy on me, and grant that I may never see such a sight. I think it impossible for thirty persons to be mistaken. The judge believed the men's testimony, and Mrs. Booty lost her case. Reports of this case make reference to the court records being available to view, my resources do not stretch to a visit to the public records office specifically to search them out, and so I shall leave the final verdict to you. What about a sand dune the size of 1,000 football pitches swallowing up streets of houses in England? Well, there is an area of England known as Thetford Forest. Thetford Forest is a modern creation of man, about 50,000 acres of pine trees originally planted around 100 years ago. The area in which the forest was planted is known as the Breckland, a vast area of gorse-covered sandy heathland. In 1668, Thomas Wright wrote to the Royal Society with details of a most unusual occurrence. Apparently, the problem started at a large rabbit warren near Lakenheath, 
within living memory, when sand covering some eight to ten acres began a slow march northeast. Driven by the prevailing winds, the mass had grown to one thousand acres within four years, and moving across sandy ground, it grew in size. It then arrived at Mr. Wright's settlement of Downham, where it sat on the outskirts for ten to twelve years before marching onward again. It covered a mile in just two months, and began to overwhelm the town, burying Mr. Wright's own buildings up to the eaves. His efforts to stop the onslaught with fences and hedging resulted in sandbanks sixty feet high, the sand eventually arriving at the River Ouse behind Wright's property, where it filled a three-mile stretch, making it nearly impassable for river vessels. From sand to sandwiches, would you believe for a moment that there was once a man who was kept alive by corvids who brought him bread and meat? Well, that one's straight from the Bible, so I have no need to quote you chapter and verse. You can look it up for yourselves. Only two to go now? How about a woman in Godalming, Surrey, who gave birth to ickle bunny rabbits? This story starts in 1726 with John Howard, a man of probity, character and capacity in his profession who has practiced midwifery for above these 30 years. Howard had detailed several deliveries of rabbits in two letters before writing a third on 9th of November which said, Sir, since I wrote to you, I have taken or delivered the poor woman of three more rabbits, all three half-grown, one of them a dun rabbit. The last leapt twenty-three hours in the uterus before it died. As soon as the eleventh rabbit was taken away, up leapt the twelfth rabbit, which is now leaping. If you have any curious person that is pleased to come post, may see another leap in her uterus, and shall take it from her if he pleases, which will be a great satisfaction to the curious. If she had been with child, she has but ten days more to go, so I do not know how many rabbits may be behind. I have brought the woman to Guildford for better convenience. This unusual event caught the notice of Nathaniel St. André, surgeon to the royal household of George I. St. André headed straight to Guildford, arriving to be told that Mary Toft was about to be delivered of rabbit number 15. He himself then delivered her of the 15th rabbit, or rabbit part, which he describes as the trunk of a rabbit of four months' growth devoid of skin. Upon examining her, including her breasts, where he found milk being produced, he conjectured that the rabbits were being formed in her fallopian tubes. St. André then had to leave her, and whilst away she was delivered of number 16, this time the lower part of a male rabbit, which St. André appears to suggest is part of the same rabbit which he had delivered. Later that night, another delivery, this time of the skin, which the earlier deliveries had been missing. This was later followed by the head. The king's surgeon was fully convinced that he had witnessed and delivered supernatural births, and presented his findings to court. St. André had been accompanied to Guildford by the secretary to the Prince of Wales, who corroborated his evidence in writing, and stated that, I can further affirm that I did not perceive the least circumstance of fraud in the conduct of this affair while I was in Guildford. While all this was going on, one man, Sir Richard Manningham, physician and member of the Royal Society, Nullius in Verba, was suspicious from the off. During the deliveries at Guildford, Manningham had expressed his thoughts that one item delivered was nothing more than a pig's bladder. He agreed to keep his suspicions to himself pending further investigation, St. André making no mention of these suspicions in his own report of the affair. Manningham became more suspicious when Mary Toft was brought to London, and by degrees obtained an admission of fraud from her. From her confession it would appear that after she had miscarried, an acquaintance pushed the claws and body of a cat and head of a rabbit into her uterus, and afterwards she had stuffed herself with many rabbit parts. The reason it would seem was that she had been told that she would want for nothing if she could regularly pull rabbits out of her hat. These foreign objects irritated her uterus such that she suffered painful involuntary contractions and spat out furballs at irregular intervals. The medical profession took a serious pounding from the satirists of the day on this one. St. André in particular suffered. Why were men trained in childbirth willing to believe that a woman could give birth to rabbits? You'd never have believed that, would you? But would you believe that there was a baboon in paid employment with the South African Railways working as a signalman? 
James Jumper Wide was a guard on Cape Government Railways. One day, failing to live up to his cognomen, he slipped whilst jumping between wagons, fell to the track, and lost both legs at the knee. Crippled thus, he took to working as a signalman. Some time later, he came across a young baboon leading an ox wagon in town, apparently not a unique thing in South Africa. Wide obtained the baboon with the idea that it could push the trolley he had constructed to convey himself the half mile to work each day. Jack, the baboon, was obviously bright and began aping certain of Wide's actions in the signal box. No mean feat for a monkey. Eventually Jack was operating the signal levers without supervision, knowing which levers to operate for which trains, and the difference between up trains and down trains. Jack became something of a local celebrity, and this caused the railway to carry out an official investigation. Jack passed all the tests asked of him, and was enrolled as an employee of the railway, paid in rations of food, candles, a treat, and brandy, a daily tot. Well, that's the end of my tall tales for today. Which do you believe now? And which do you still think? No way. Why we believe things fascinates me. What fascinates me more is why a story which no one would believe suddenly becomes believable to some people simply because it appears in a particular book or is given a certain authority. The ideas of Aristotle, Galen and others held sway for many centuries and sometimes even after they had been disproven by the scientific method. I said that we do not choose what we believe, but I think that we should always ask ourselves why we believe what we believe. By testing our beliefs against reality, we can come ever closer to only accepting as true that which is demonstrable, or at least consistent with the operation of the natural world as we understand it. A woman giving birth to rabbits? No way. A talking donkey? Sure. A man fitting into a wine bottle? Don't make me laugh. But a man living for three days in a fish? Why not? There is a very good reason why religious leaders continually urge their flocks to accept the incredible upon faith alone. Can you guess what that reason is? Thank you, as always, for watching.